We have four session chairs. I would just quickly like to introduce them to you. We have Adam Habib, who is Vice Chancellor at the University of Witwatersrand. Hello, Professor Habib. Hi, how are you, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? Okay, man. Um, we have Sylvia Schwachsega, who is Deputy Vice Chancellor at Lund University. Thank you. We have uh, Joshua Bagakas, who is uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs Research and Innovation at KCA University in Kenya. Hi, everyone. Hi. Mm -hmm. And we have Christiane Schmecken, who is Director of Strategy at the DAD. Good morning. I will directly uh, hand over to John Gill, who will now chair this second panel and uh, talk a little bit with the panelists slash session chairs about what was discussed so efficiently in these breakout sessions. Aaron, thank you very much um, for the invitation to be here. I can confirm that, that Nana, who was in my group, was making a very interesting point and it was, it was uh, guillotined. Um, <laughs> so uh, I hope we can pick up some of those, those points that were discussed in the conversation which follows. Um, yeah, I'm really pleased to be here and we have, they've already been introduced to you, but we have Adam, Sylvia, Joshua and Christian as our um, panellists reporting back on the conversation which has followed. I have to say I've, I've, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed the, the conversation so far. I think it's been really interesting. And we want to move on now to specifically the question of fostering cross-regional collaboration. Um, panellists, if I, if I could maybe start by picking up on a point that was made by I think now remain in the in the last session, which is that in a way we've had a number of phases of this um, switch to remote learning during the pandemic. We've had sort of you know an emergency shift in phase one, crisis hit, and but business continuity was really the key, and that was down to to often individuals and or certainly institutions at a fairly micro level just to shift very quickly what they were doing online to ensure continuity. I think we've then had a phase two. Um, over the last couple of months where we've perhaps developed more coherent, thought through institutional and perhaps national responses. And now I suppose phase three is what comes next. And, and that must include regional in, cross regional collaboration. And so my question to you panelists is, is that an accurate description of the journey we've been on? And if so, are we now ready to implement phase three, which is that uh, regional cross regional collaboration? And I'll put that question, if I can, first to, to uh, Christiane. Uh, I think you'll, you'll have an interesting perspective on this. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, in our discussion in, um, in our little group, uh, we were quite, um, we all shared the same opinion that there is no one size fits all solution for digitalization. And that context is very uh, different and also key to how we should get along with uh, the future of digitalization. As you said, in the emergency situation, we all tried to find solutions, but now I think we need to have a more um, sophisticated look at what we are planning to do. And um, in our group, when we talked about that different conditions also create different needs and different problems, etc., we had a couple of examples. Uh, the first thing we stated was that if technology is available, then inclusion is possible, and then uh, uh, digital tools may help to, to reach out to, to a larger public to include more people. But if technology is deficient or not working or too expensive or whatever, then this inclusiveness will not happen. Uh, then uh, also we had the point of uh, content if you want to move to, to a more regular form of uh, uh, digital teaching, what you need is content in different languages because in many countries in the world, uh, teaching happens in a different language than English or French or whatever. So uh, for example, uh, the example was made by Nariman. She said, there's very little content in Arabic language available. And that makes it tricky to, to do this. Uh, and the last point that we made was that, uh, especially in countries where there's not uh, such a perfect infrastructure available, there is 
financial support is needed either by government or by the university, etc. So this transformation needs also support. So that actually, I must admit now very freely that this is also, I summed up our whole conversation because after the pre presentations, <laughs> that's we, that was point one and we managed to talk about that for the rest. I will need to improvise. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the what's absolutely clear from, from all the conversations is that there are very clear points of differentiation on a certainly on a national nation by nation um, or system by system level that, that that are kind of you know obstacles that will need to be overcome nevertheless Joshua if I could perhaps come to you do, do you feel that you know as institutional leaders and drawing on the conversation you've had in your group session um, you are as institutions ready to think about that phase three you know how do you really strategically look at cross-regional collaboration to, to, to develop the, the uh, you know, the, the way that we want to go forward with. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, actually it is true uh, that uh, context is important, uh, but we also wanted to appreciate the fact that collaboration is going to be very, very critical. Uh, in fact, we have lived it, especially in my institution, we lived with the benefits of collaboration. Now, one of the things which came up in our discussion as well is the challenge of the digital divide. The digital divide among students. Of course, we had the digital divide among the faculty, so we had to retrain them. Some of them had not done anything about the any learning management system. In fact, it's only 10% of our faculty who actually interacted with the, the the running management system, the rest about 90%, they didn't even know what it was. And so we actually have to train them so that they can, so there was that digital divide. But then in the context of our country, you find that the students don't have connectivity, they don't have the gadgets and all that. And the university does not have the capacity to do that quickly. And now this is where the partnership with banks partnership with the telecommunication companies came handy and they were able to work for a win-win, you know, because, you know, we were able to get some students to get some very nice long-term loans so they can actually pay over time, you know. So that partnership is important. The other piece is even the knowledge part. In fact, in the training of the faculty, we found out that we could engage some of the experts from the US who could actually work with our faculty so that they can bring them up to speed in terms of, of, of other things. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is also the, what has come up as, you know, this was an emergence. We were responding to a situation but it actually helped us to discover some things which we should have been thinking about all the time. Especially in the assessment, we actually had to rethink about how do we assess? Why do we assess? Which aspects of Broome's taxonomy do we actually focus on? Because you, we were not really thinking about all this. And now when the COVID came, and if you had to rethink that, we actually had to do that. So, um, you know, I can see that the normal, the new normal is actually going to be perhaps more better than where we have left. Thank you, Joshua. I think, you know, that's one of the, whenever I've been discussing um, on panel debates and, and, and other conference sessions, the, these questions with university leaders, it has always become clear that there's a strong sense that we have accelerated things that needed to happen anyway. We have moved very quickly down the road and universities aren't famous for being, you know, the, the, the fastest moving institutions. It can be hard to, to change a strategy and to implement change. But that, that there has been an accelerating effect of this that actually has often not necessarily introduced entirely new concepts, but moved us perhaps five years down the road, you know, in, in the course of six months, which has been interesting. Adam, I'll, I'll perhaps come to you for, for some opening reflections on, on your group's discussion and perhaps this point of, 
of the key areas of differentiation between systems that are, that are going to either necessitate collaboration or make collaboration difficult, whether that's, I don't know, the digital infrastructure question, the staff and student skill set question, uh, social attitudes, cultural attitudes, financial issues. Could I pass over to you, Adam? Yeah. So I'm going to re, uh, kind of uh, follow two lines of inquiry. One was, I think, raised by both colleagues, but particularly highlighted by Joshua. Uh, and what, what that was, was context, the importance of context and the importance of inequality. And, and I think you're absolutely right that we accelerated the pace of change. Universities can be very slow to move on anything, but then it's in particular moments and crisis, they, they can move quite effectively. And what we've seen around the world, uh, quite uh, quick mobilizations by universities to respond to the challenge. Now, the real issue is most of us have gone online. What is interesting is that we've gone online in very, very different contexts. So what Joshua is speaking about is, yes, we've gone online, like everybody else, but because of the deep inequalities within the society, you've got to divide, go online and address challenges that you wouldn't normally do so. So for instance, at WITS, uh, we bought 5,000 laptops and circulated it among students that didn't have it. What we did is negotiated with service providers around connectivity so that all 37,000 students could access connectivity. We focused residents' return on those who did not have uh, appropriate social and living circumstances that allowed them. And what you're beginning to see is to grapple with your context, you have to make, uh, you have to find solutions. And those solutions are not only useful for your context, but they can be taken back to the developed world and applied in different ways in those contexts as well, because those challenges may exist in smaller numbers, but they still exist in those contexts as well. So I just put that on the table and it flows out of the conversation that came out of there. Mm. The second is the conversation on how, what came out in our group was a real discussion about, we need to start taking this conversation on a transnational level. I mean, the real challenge of our time, what COVID-19 has really shown is that effectively our challenges are transnational in character, whether it's global health, climate change, inequality, social and political polarization. And our response has to be now conceived on a transnational uh, uh, platform. But, and so we can do some things immediately, Alice, suggested uh, uh, how we think to the possibility of opening up our digital courses to everybody, to our partners. That's important. But it seems to me what we're also saying is as much as we do those individual actions, a different philosophy of internationalization. At the moment, internationalization is offer good scholarships to people in the developing world bring them to London, New York, and Berlin. Many of them don't return. And effectively, the problem remains. We weaken institutional capacity and human capabilities. But now we have the digital technologies to offer transnational courses, to bring world-class technologies and local knowledge together, to look at transdisciplinarity. And so we need to reimagine this. And as somebody in my group said, some of this is already happening as part of the COIL initiative. But those are small initiatives rather than the general practice. And so we're going to have to rethink and reimagine higher education in quite fundamental ways. And there are challenges around this because of national funding, because of national system capacity, uh, et cetera. But to do that, we need to do a couple of things. We need effective communication and an open conversation across global boundaries. We need, as Nora suggested, a review of policies so that this is enabled and we can get compatibility between different systems. We need quality assurance that goes beyond 
uh, institutional to kind of national and global conversations uh, in this regard. And frankly, to be honest, I hate saying this, we need an imagination where some institutions around the world don't think that they're there to train the world's people. What we have to start thinking about doing is forcing everybody to say, we collectively going to train across national and, and we're going to collectively train across this and blended learning is going to enable movement between face-to-face -face and digital, but it's also going to enable learning and picking up courses from colleagues in Germany and the US and Beijing and, and Nairobi and Johannesburg. And we're going to morph these. And then we need an accreditation question and a quality assurance question that enables that and a policy nexus that enables that. So this is possible. Technologically, we can do this. We need political will, and we also need the global conversations that enable this. And that conversation needs to be more nuanced, less about whether we need to do it, and more about how we make it happen. How do we ensure that somebody in the middle of Guinea-Bissau can have access to the same quality education? And the digitized technologies enable that if we can reimagine higher education on a global plane. I think that's in part, if you like, a capturing of the conversation we had in our breakaway group. But I must say it's been colored by me in particular ways. So my colleagues might want to intervene and give their views around some of the issues I raised. I'll stop there. Thank you. Adam, thank, thank you very much indeed. I'll, I'll come now to Sylvia. Um, Sylvia, I was in, in the same breakout session as you, and, and uh, in that discussion, as with some of the contributions so far, we did particularly touch on the, the specific uh, network, connectivity, cultural, and, and, and in some cases, hardware issues. Adam was talking about having to distribute um, gadgets and technology to, to students just to allow continuity. Of course, Sylvia, at the University of Lund, you're, you're in a slightly different uh, um, environment too. I wonder if you can reflect perhaps on your own uh, local and national context in Sweden um, and, and, and how perhaps more developed systems can make sure they are contributing to that cross-regional collaboration that we've, that, that, that we've been discussing is so important in, in the most effective way. Thanks, John, and, and thanks for a really interesting discussion so far. I mean, I think coming back to your initial question, I, I, I completely agree with what you said and also what uh, Nariman has said about the, you know, we're moving from an emergency shift to potentially a more coherent change. And my concern is that actually the coherent change is not guaranteed or response is not guaranteed to happen and that a lot has to fall in place for that to happen and as joshua said you know higher education not least in developed countries for a long time has been dealing with challenges we've been slow with digitalization we've been slow with inclusiveness and social mobility we've been slow with uh, for example gender equality so you know um this crisis is hitting uh i would argue higher education institutions at a time when they've already been struggling with with sort of you know keeping abreast with it with the changing society around them and and i'm not so sure that we have aligned everything that we need to align to make sure that this is going to be the sort of cathartic moment um, that it could be so so i think also what has been said by previous speakers what was really interesting in our session is talking about how um you know, what is happening right now risks exacerbating inequalities, right, between those who have both everything from like the physical space to be able to do this, what we're doing right now, you know, not have kids running around in the background or not have other people or, you know, sitting in somebody's kitchen, but also having the internet connectivity to do it. Um, I think what was really interesting, and that's something I've been following in general, is that the pandemic so far has actually disadvantaged, for example, women more than it's disadvantaged men. And we see that in girls' education, we see that in women's contribution to research. So, you know, so what we're, I think there, we're at a real risk right now um, with this situation exacerbating inequality across institutions because studies have shown for the UK, but also for the US that, you know, the top institutions in the world are probably gonna emerge stronger from this crisis. Whereas, uh, you know, universities around the world that were struggling before are gonna struggle even more financially. So I think we're going to see increasing inequality across regions, across institutions, but also within social classes and social, you know, social communities. And we really have to think about how we use this opportunity. I think Adam was talking about that. Joshua was talking about that to, 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 to be the 
transformative moment rather than the moment when we're going to look back and say this made all this even worse. And, um, and that's going to take a lot of effort. And maybe from my perspective in Sweden, I would argue, yes, autonomy is important, but we do also have a certain institutional rigidity. And um, we have quite a lot of autonomy. And actually, ironically speaking, in Sweden, we're in a quite good position. You know, the government has increased our, the number of students that are funded. It's increased our research funding. So it's really, the response from the government has been very positive in the sense that it said, you know, we need universities more than ever. But my concern is, are we up to the challenge to, you know, to transform our education in the ways that all of you have spoken about that we need to transform it? So I think it's very relevant to talk about these three different levels that Nariman talked about, you know, the individuals, the courses, but also the institution and the, and the national response. And, and right now, um, I see like what's happening now being both a huge opportunity for addressing inequality, but also a huge threat. But it's also a huge opportunity, as Adam said, for strengthening international collaboration because we can bring the world into the classroom in a totally different way than we've been able to do it before. But on the other hand, we have rising nationalism. We have governments that are telling us we should focus only on our on our own students, you know, not on other countries. Um, so, you know, it's it's the jury is definitely out where universities are going to end up as a result of this turbulence and crisis. And I, yeah, thank, thank you, Sylvia. I think focusing on that e equality and access issue is really important. In the conversation we had in the in the in the breakout, I, I was making the point purely from a UK perspective that one of the big debates in UK higher education, even prior to the pandemic, was around value and an increasing push to perhaps suggest that too many people are going to university, that they're not getting value. UK has a relatively high tuition fee system. So the question was was all about is the investment giving you a return in terms of your 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 salary once you graduate? And of course, the answer then is, you know, fewer people should go to institutions, there should be fewer universities, we should funnel more people into vocational routes. And I think that um, the, the shift to online has perhaps exacerbated that debate, because students themselves are saying, well, am I getting value in return for the money I'm putting into my education if I'm not having that face to face interaction? So there are real, um, these are very thorny issues, I think, for, for universities in right around the world, whether it's a developed system or, or or in other regions. I wonder if I could pick up this issue of the political situation as well. Clearly the pandemic has in some ways um, uh, forced a certain insularity amongst politicians. Um, we have seen that anyway in terms of fragmentation of, of geopolitics and of course you also have higher education systems operating within the local jurisdiction. You ha all have regulators you know deciding how funding is distributed. Many of you will have governments trying to push universities towards certain type of courses, delivering skills for the economy and so on. Is that also going to get, get in the way of regional collaboration? And if it is, is there anything as university leaders that you can do about it? Would any of my panelists like to come in on that? Can I come in? Adam, yes. So, I, you know, I, I think that that was really interesting uh, uh, that was, was particularly put on by Sylvia. And so yes, I think nationalism is on the agenda. There's, there's two things happening actually. On the one hand, there is a kind of vaccine nationalism and a crude nationalism that is asking us to look internally. But simultaneously, there's a counter that's playing out. And we, for the first time, beginning to recognize in a real sense that the world is uh, in a single planet and that all of the challenges don't stop at our borders. So frankly, whatever the nativists or ethno-nationalists want to believe, COVID-19 is they never going to be safe from it unless all of us are safe from it. And we kind of like lucky that COVID-19 for all of its tragedy has a mortality rate of less than two to 3%. Can you imagine if it had been Ebola at 45 or 50% and then the global scale of death and tragedy would be so much more. And in that context, for the first time, national leaders are going to have to start recognizing how do we collectively create the capacities for us to address it? 
And actually, it's as important in the middle of Sweden that, that uh, they, they tackle the problem in Guinea-Bissau or in Burundi as much as in Berlin. Uh, because if that doesn't happen, somebody will land on a plane and land at the airport. And then they've got a problem in the district. And so I think there's a, there's a moment where there is much more required from higher education leaders. For us to be compliant officials or responsive to national politicians is uh, not what the moment requires. The moment requires us to respond to the politicians. Now, I'm not asking for you to become a politician by any means, but what I am asking for is what is one of the mandates that is the university? To have the cap capability to open up difficult conversations and to say to our governments, actually, it is absolutely important that we give Nairobi the ability to meet the kinds of public health challenges that it needs to, because if it doesn't have that capacity, it will come back to haunt us in Uppsala or in Berlin or in London. And that, you know, politicians are incapable of opening that up. It's higher education leaders that have to have the courage to open that up. But we're only going to do that if we actually walk out of the ivory tower and say, it's time for us to speak truth to power, not only to government or leaders, but also frankly, to civil society associations who are also trying to, to, to in, look insular and to try and protect themselves. We have to say to all of our people, turning insular and protecting ourselves is not possible in this world. We actually have to go global to protect the local. And it seems to me that that conversation should be led by vice chancellors. Because if that's what we don't do, then we've just lost out. Too many vice chancellors are simply focused on their bottom line. They so simply focused on the institutional brand. They simply focus on making their institution work. Well, frankly, the institution can't work unless all of us work. And that's the collective message that we all need to not only, you know, rhetorically speak about, but we need to internalize. And mm. frankly, I don't think higher education leaders have internalized it sufficiently across the world. Sorry, I'll stop there. But, but really, really interesting. I mean, Joshua or Sylvia, as institutional leaders, would you like to respond or, or comment further on that? Yes, actually, I, I could like to do that. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a lot of levels of collaboration and the effective communication is key. In fact, I see that as, uh, as a key issue for the success of what we can be able to do for the new normal. One of the collaborations I found which was so critical at a very low level is being able to effectively communicate with the student readership. Because you can do everything, set up very good uh, platforms and all that, but if students are not buying into it, then it just can't work. You know, the other one is being deliberate about this collaboration, such that we actually have to think about the general good rather than the competition to whose benefit it is, even across institutions, such that you focus on the general good rather than um, I want to be the one who is benefiting more. Because there's a lot of things to be shared. Here's one example which for me, uh, it opened my eyes. As we were trying to negotiate with the bank so that we can be able to make computers available to students, then the bank gave us a condition that we'll give you the money, but with the condition that the only computers you can give to students are the brand new ones. And then there is the market which has the ones they call rebabished, where you get a good, very good computer, but it is not brand new for a price which is half the price of if you could buy it. And again, this is where 
students, I mean, the, the students cannot afford the brand new ones. Then you compare it with what is in the society where the same politicians are buying the ex-Japan cars, big SUVs, but they are pre-owned from Japan. But for the students, they don't want to do this. So we actually had to engage and say, you know, we have to change our mindset. And so this collaboration at all levels for the good of the general good rather than who is going to benefit, I think is, is key. Thank you. Um, Sylvia, perhaps I'll come to you. Adam, there was a bit of a call to arms there for vice chancellors uh, to, to really, you know, Seize the, seize the moment. Do you think that, that's correct? And do you think vice chancellors are, are up for that challenge? Uh, I, I actually strongly agree with Adam. I, I think that, I mean, there was a very interesting, I followed a really interesting discussion about among university leaders in the US and, and uh, as one of the sort of presidents of a predominantly black American college said, you know, we need to start assuming greater responsibility in repairing our societies. You know, we, we, we think that we are sort of, we need, I think we have a little bit too much of a tendency to think we need to defend our institutions from society. Um, but, you know, that we need to really rethink because I think our societies are in crisis. And I, as you said, John, I think, you know, it's our legitimacy that's on the line long term. And so, therefore, and I think we should be able to do this while defending academic freedom and while, you know, maintaining excellence. But I completely agree that I think we need to sort of rise to the challenge like for example international collaboration you know five years ago nobody would have questioned a university that said we want to increase international collaboration now we have politicians telling us that you know we should prioritize our national interests and i think that's happening across you know countries and regions so it's now that we need to stand up for internationalization not five years ago when everybody thought it was a totally you know non no-brainer that we should be collaborating so and i really see some interesting just listening to the panel that we had, I see some really fascinating and huge opportunities for this cross-regional collaboration. For example, across also between Europe and Africa, because I think we, you know, we bring slightly different, we have a fundamentally the same tasks, but we bring very different co contextual perspectives to the table. And I think that could really inject both um, pooling of resources, you know, this kind of renewal that we need, because. To be honest, like in Sweden, you know, our universities, our teachers are tired from, you know, switching. They're they're exhausted from the switch to to from COVID. They the last thing they want to do is think about the future. Um, but as as somebody wrote, you know, in the chat, that's now that we need to think about the future, and we need to bear in mind what happens if we don't think about the future right now. You know, we're talking about giving bonuses to our teachers because they switch to online, and I think they've done a fantastic job. But unfortunately, you know, it's still not going to be enough for what we have to do together. So I would just totally um, endorse that, that, you know, we, we have a moment here to shine, but we need to really work for it. Mm -hmm. I think, thank you. We, we're coming towards the end of, uh, of this session. Let, let me cut, give a final word to perhaps to Christiane as well about this, this idea that now is a moment for for renewal and reinvigoration and perhaps doubling down on the international collaborative element of, of what higher education does. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I totally agree with what everybody said. Uh, uh, to my understanding, uh, what this crisis is teaching us as well is that mobility is not an end in itself and that, to my understanding, collaboration is the new currency of internationalization. I think we need to work on this. What really counts is that people are working together on topics that they are working together on global challenges, on sustainable solutions for, for the world of tomorrow. And this may include some part of mobility, but this is not what we should be focusing upon. And I would like to share uh, uh, an experience we made also with our funding programs because we are awarding scholarships to individual persons. And in the during the crisis, this market broke together more or less totally, you know, because people were just not able to travel. They tried to postpone, but then the crisis was still there, etc. Uh, so mobility uh, in itself is quite vulnerable in a world which is getting more complicated every day. So I think we really need to focus on co cooperations and DID is doing that and 
we noticed that corporations, apart from all the other advantages that they have, are really much more resilient than individual stays abroad. And I also consider them touching upon what was said earlier as a perfect laboratory for creating these joint solutions that we need in the field of uh, content, of accreditation, of assessment, of uh, a joint quality assurance system. All of this will not happen if we don't have very strong, reliable, resilient cooperations. Uh, and I, I, I totally agree that this needs to, this is, uh, this is the method, but then the result, which is uh, solidarity in finding solutions, this needs to be communicated to the outside world and to society because uh, this has really changed. I mean, we really have something to say about how, how will the future be built? Well, thank you. We, we do, I mean, we have 10 minutes or so left in this session and Anne has um, kindly suggested that since this is a, you know, a conversation that is, is, is really interesting and ongoing, we could perhaps open this up to, to the rest of the group. Would anybody else like to come in? There's lots of, of chat in the text chat box that I see, but would be, uh, I'd be keen to invite anyone else to, to join in and make any comments if they'd like to. Uh, perhaps you could just wave at me. It's probably the easiest way if you'd like to do that. Any takers? I mean, while you're while you're gathering your thoughts, maybe I'll just make one one observation. I, I was recently talking, uh, uh, thinking about Adam's point about vice chancellors stepping up and and uh, and becoming more active and vocal. It is also the case, I think, that you know the great power of of universities is, of course, their, their faculty and many of the interactions that go on many of the, the great collaborations and contributions to, to the world, whether it's through science and research or anything else, are from faculty and from the bottom up rather than the top down. I was talking recently to Ron Daniels, who's the president of Johns Hopkins University, and um, he was referencing the, the fantastic data work that, that Johns Hopkins have done during this pandemic, which has provided such a contribution to the global understanding of COVID-19 and how it has spread. And the point he made was that he had absolutely nothing to do with that as, as president of Johns Hopkins. It was an initiative that came very organically from a young engineer, um, which really took off. But what he was able to do as a university leader was really throw Johns Hopkins resources behind it once it became clear the great value that it had and amplify something that, um, you know, has contributed a huge amount to the world. But as I say, was very much uh, a scholarly innovation from a young engineer and, and, and a strategic team that understood the value of that and then you know, gave, gave that, that team the stage to, to do it. And I suppose that's an interesting uh, take on this as well, that it can't all come from vice chancellors or be strategy led. Um, it has to be about facilitating what your faculty do and want to do and the collaborations that exist there as well. John, can I respond to that? Yes, Adam. No, you're absolutely right, uh, and I think you're absolutely right that the, the collaboration happens with academic staff, uh, and that vice chancellor's role is really to create an enabling environment to make that happen. But the point I want to make is the internationalization of the past has not been appropriate. Let's be honest; it's been unequal. Research questions get determined in the north, and frankly, they do not. I'm not particularly responsive to the challenges uh, of the South. And what we've got to do is reimagine internationalization in what I would say a more network institutional direction, uh, which mitigates the very unequal world we live in. And so, yes to internationalization. Yes to that. But imagine this. Imagine if we said, in the developed world. We're not going to take all of the scholarships we, we give. We're going to take 50% of that. We're going to give it for people located in the developing world, in institutions, and we're going to support those institutions to do in partner with us and do the joint courses. We're going to do joint supervision. What you're in effect doing is you're not only empowering the individual, you're empowering the institution, you're enabling human capabilities to be built there, and then you can allow for some mobility. But then you make, it, you make it, if you like, a much more equal internationalization agenda, 
We have had internationalization, but ask any major research in the developing world and they will tell you it's been an unequal internationalization. And so we've got to, yes, to all of the great stuff. There are universities today in the US, UK and many other parts who believe they train the leadership of the world. And they will not do co-curriculum and they will not do co-branding because they're too worried about their institutional brand. That goes against what is required in this historical moment. And until we have the courage to tell them that, that you're so focused on your brand that you've forgotten your mission, that conversation now has to be opened up and we've been ducking it for too long. And that's the point I'm, I'm asking for. Sorry, no, no. please forgive me for being so frank. Fantastic. And uh, of course, Adam, you, you will be moving in the new year to, to the UK to take the, the reins of a UK institution. So it's going to be um, a shock to the system for UK vice, vice chancellors to have you with us, which, which we're looking forward to. Um, we, we are coming towards the end of, of, the, of, of, of our allotted time. So Anne, um, I just want to say a huge thank you to, to uh, the panelists and of course all of you. It's been a great conversation from my perspective. Anne, I'll hand back to you now. Thank you so much for this uh, great uh, conversation really with all these passionate and inspiring voices. Um, I think we, we have a lot of material to, to you know, digest and uh, work into our conversations in the future. Um, really, I think it's, it's a, it shows a good way forward. Um, just a few elements to wrap up. Um, thank you so much for um, the institutions that help support us here, uh, namely the DAD and Times Higher Education. Um, they also have really great input from the surveys that they conducted and the pre-recording. So if you would like to take a look, if you haven't already, then we encourage you to check out those videos. Um, you can also share them in your networks if you wish. Um, on Monday, we have a global slot. It's not an ideal time. I think for us, it might be an ideal time for this particular slot. So um, you're all very welcome to attend. It's on Monday at um, 3 p.m. Universal uh, Standard Time. Um, and it'll just be a one hour slot um, just as a get together because we have the Asia Pacific slot that took place this morning and later tonight we'll have the America slot and we want to bring together maybe a few of the voices from those different slots to have this cross national conversation once again um, with these different areas. So um, we'll send an email on that. We will also be um, having a report on the survey results that will come out next year. Um, we're, we'll be sharing that, so keep an eye out for that and um, we'll email you if you're interested in that um, once it is out. And um, next year we will also be having an event that we're calling the Global Learning Week where we want to allow institutions the space, give them the space to bring in their own discussions once more. Um, in a larger setting. So um, it would be a place where we would encourage other institutions to come in with workshops, with panels, um, with presentations of initiatives they're doing. Um, we will reach out again about that. So if you're interested in, in joining forces and coming in, um, presenting the discussions that have been taking place in the past year, then um, keep an eye out for that. Um, thank you so much for attending and maybe just a just a final word from Friedrich Hesse to wrap up here. Yeah, no, and I'm not going to wrap up. Uh, that's probably too difficult right now. But it was a great pleasure for me to see what kind of arguments came up, what kind of discussions came up, and what, what kind of strong need for collaboration came up. Because this is the main task we are taking over or trying to take over with the Global Learning Council. And it's not just in terms of having a scientific conference, it's more in terms of talking about on a global level, strategic ideas and ways to do something and to see how we can support each other. So to think global, to exchange global, to support the regional the, the concrete situation. 
So that's, that's our task. And Anna already mentioned that we will continue to take over this role to allow conversation, to allow collaboration and things like this. And I do have a strong wish that the, 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 the old tradition of talking about key performance indicators, key PIs, in, in having only to address research results and research uh, capacity should be enlarged that a, a strong KPI, a key performance indicator should be the quality of learning, of teaching, including the online, the online world. And in, in some cases, I know whenever I, I visit a, a, a university somewhere, like in the beginning in Sweden, the Linnaeus program, like Lund was doing quite good in the Linnaeus program, I know. But we never talked about teaching and learning and something like this. But this has to take place. And this is not just in Lund. It's all over the, the world, the same situation. And if we use collaboration for improving teaching and learning, probably even more learning, then we have to take over the responsibility to see what is the added value of online learning. And this was a great discussion about this, a great interest in collaboration, and we will, we will take this serious and continue this way. So thank you all for joining us uh, in this two hours. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.